All right, I want to extend greetings to everyone this morning. It's a real blessing to be here. Just uh, uh, we started singing that song, uh, "Thou will keep him in perfect peace." I looked around and and uh, some of the real strong voices that sing that little whippoorwill part aren't here and I'm just glad there's a couple of some of you young girls that just stepped up and filled in the place. A real blessing. So anyway. Well let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father we come to you this morning and we thank you for your goodness. Lord we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we ask your blessing, Father, on this time together. And Lord, we just ask you to fill us with your spirit. Help us to bring glory and honor to you. Lord, give us wisdom, Father, as we open your word. Give us the words to speak and the ears to hear, Father. Again, we just thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. a blessing to be here. Um, I want to probably won't use a, so much of a verse about it, but my thought is perfection. Um, you know, when we're looking for perfect, we have an idea in our mind of what something that perfect is. And our goal sometimes is to be perfect, and we want to have a perfect church. We want to have, whenever we think of that word perfect, it brings ideas into our head about what perfect means. And I think uh, the thought that we have often brings a lot of discouragement because we never obtain to that kind of perfection. It's just never, uh, we never get there. And... If we're striving for that, and the harder we try for it, the more we see our failings, and we just get discouraged about being perfect because we never get there. But that's the word perfect that we think of, and the word perfect that God is looking for is two entirely different things. The, the church, the world says that there's nothing perfect. And the world says, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect church. And, you know, I understand what they're trying to say, but in God's sense, there is perfection. It's not what we think it is. Often it may be exactly opposite of what we think it is because we're looking for some perfect thing and God is looking for someone with a perfect heart that that doesn't always translate to excellent performance outside. We want to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Verse For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Here I want to just set the, set the table here just a little bit. But it says, um, here was a man going on a journey and he had slaves. What? did the slaves possess of themselves? Absolutely nothing. They're slaves. They don't even have their freedom. They're slaves. And I think sometimes if we just get to that place whenever we're thinking about God, our whole life is a gift. And every aspect of it, we have absolutely nothing to bring to the table. We were set on the table. And what we've been given 
or what we have, what we are, who we are, is nothing. You have done absolutely not one thing to add to that. All right, to you had nothing to do with it. What you have, what you are, who you are, where you are, every aspect of your life is a gift from God. It's a gift. This man that had, was going on this journey, he owned slaves, and he entrusted him. He trusted them with his possessions. Everything's his, just like it is with God. Everything's his. And anything that you have is something that God has given you. It's a possession of God. Your very life itself is something that God has given us. And I think we lose sight of that. I think in the world, the world certainly loses sight of it. They think they're here to serve themselves. They think they're here to live for themselves. They think they're here. Most of them don't even have a clue of why they're here. That's why they're so miserable, because they're just trying to satisfy themselves. But everything we have, everything that we are, is a gift from God. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Here again, we'll break in just a little bit. He gave five talents to one person, two to one person, and one to one person. According to his ability. Okay, now if we look at that on a spiritual sense, where's our ability come from? It comes from God. So whenever we look at this idea, you know, a lot of times we think that we're able to accomplish something or we're really able to be given something and take it and just do something with it. Why? It's because God gave us the ability to do that. Now there's some people that waste that uh, but the very ability that we have to do anything comes from God. And I think we do well just to really let that soak in to our hearts and minds that we breathe because God's given us air. We're able to drink water because God's provided it for us. You know, we thank God for our food and the people who prepared it. Well, without God letting it grow or being able to be produced in this world, it would never, it would have, it didn't matter how good a cook you are, if you don't have nothing but rocks to eat, you're not going to be a very good cook. So your ability is, everything that we have comes from God. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. These two went out and took the abilities that God had given with the ability that God had given them, took the resources that God had given, and increased it. In the same manner, the one who had received or, but he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of, the, of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gathered, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent, came up and said, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away, and I hid your talent 
in the ground. See, have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has more shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Throw out the worthless slave out into outer darkness in that place where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The talents, what God has given us. You know, our thought a lot of times is if we just, you know, if we uh, really accomplish, we really just take what God has given us and just really go to the extreme with it and just really carry it out, then we're being faithful. Here's where the, uh, what God is talking about, often there's a, there's a uh, disconnect here because our mind goes to the physical and the, this realm when we think of those things and whenever we think of the talents, we're thinking of abilities a lot of times. We're thinking that we just make sure we do everything that we can because we're able to and that's what he's talking about. But that's in the spiritual realm that's not the way things are you know a lot of times whenever we look at the disciples or the people in the bible that's followed the lord and we look at who he chose the men that he put his stamp of approval on often it wasn't the one that was so efficient and had everything just in order but it was the one that was pretty well cast aside and often oftentimes it looked like they were just not very valuable but yet that's who God chose we when we look at our when we think about talents what I want to stress more than anything is that anything that you have God has given you and when we look at what God appreciates, grace, and mercy, forgiveness, you know, a lot of times we have the tendency because we have, may see ourselves as someone who's very talented and we're excelling. And so what we do is we begin to look down at somebody that can't do what we can do or isn't quite as good as what we can do. And so we have the tendency to look down on them. So while we're thinking that we're really putting God's talents to work, while we're looking down on someone else or not as appreciative of someone else that can't do what we can do, we're doing the exact opposite of what God would want us done with our talents. You see, if we have the talent to do better than someone else or excel in something better than anyone else, to truly put God's talents into perspective, we're looking at someone else that's not quite where we are with full of mercy and full of grace and full of just like God looking down upon us. Not getting all upset because somebody can't keep up or somebody can't do what I can do, but being right there to look at it and looking at it through a spiritual realm. Looking and realizing that God uses the weak things in the earth. You know, in First Corinthians it says that First Corinthians chapter one says 
it says in verse 26, it says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble. Verse 27 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who, be, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. You know, if we, when we look at life, we have the tendency, so much in us, to look at our accomplishments and our abilities. But these verses, it says consider in verse 26, but then it says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. You know, one of the things that seems like the more we get right in the physical sense, the tendency is to lose the spiritual sense of, of where we really need to be. The more we are right, the more things that look perfect, the closer we get to that perfect that we imagine in our own minds, most of the time that has a tendency to draw us away from that which is truly perfect. It's pretty difficult for us to, uh, you know, as we go through life and we've got a church, we've got a church family, and it's a real blessing to have those. But it's, there's such a tendency for us to look around and begin to think, wow, we've got things going, going pretty good, you know. We would never say that out loud, but in our hearts and our minds, we begin to look at that through that perfection, and then we begin to, to put that perfection in, well, this is it. And, we get, and what happens is, is we get comfortable, and we get lazy in that, and we forget that God uses things that are broken a lot of times. God uses things that are weak a lot of time. And so the things that we see as physical in the physical realm as strong strong and right and all of those things, often those can be the very things that actually keep us from where God really wants us to be. It's good to have these things. It's good. It's a blessing to have the support. But have it with poor, have a poor spirit. Have it with a spirit of meekness, a spirit of grace, a spirit of mercy, knowing that it is a precious gift that we have been given, that we've been, and it nothing of our own doing for the situation that we're put in. You know, it's, when we think about God using the weak things, you know, and here we are trying to be as strong as we can, and I'm not, I, I'm not saying, oh, I'll just give up and be weak, but it's a, it's a weak, it's an attitude of, of grace, grace, gratefulness. It's a spirit of being thankful for what we're given. Seeing ourselves as not accomplishing anything, not being anything, but being a vessel that God can use. You know, when Jesus told his disciples to follow him, he said, take up your cross 
to follow me. You know, when we think of perfection, probably one of the last things we think of is someone carrying a cross. They've been beat up. You know, they're probably not walking the straightest path because there's a big old weight on their back. And so they're weak and they're stumbling, they're hurting, they're broken, and they're carrying this huge old heavy thing on their back. That's, that's not what we see as perfection, is it? But that's what Jesus saw we needed to bring us closer to Him. You know, the things that our abilities or the things that we think we might be able to do, God's looking for that person, that people that are willing to lay all of that aside and just pick up an old cross and carry it. Paul said that when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. You know, we, we all want that place of peace where we're just at rest. You know, we love the idea of peace and rest. And that peace and that rest can be right in the middle of storms and trouble. It can be right in the middle of all of that and we can still have that peace. It's not the peace where we're just laid back, oh, just resting all the time, just dozing here and there because nothing's bothering us. It's peace because whatever happens in our life, we're trusting in God. I think one of the big problems just in the world today, you know, there's a lot of people that well, the big movement is that uh, you can't hardly say anything or it's not politically correct. And the reason is, is because somebody gets their feelings hurt or they get offended because you said something. You know where that comes from? That comes from complacency. That comes from people who have never faced a struggle in their lives that's never had any problems. Everything's just been handed to them. And they've become so soft inside, or so, their soul is so weak and puny that anybody that says anything to them, it just goes completely through them and offends them, hurts their feelings. And they get upset and they lash out and they they try to band together and keep anybody from saying anything that would offend these poor little things that have never had a hard day in their lives. That comes from complacency. That comes from never having a struggle. And I think a lot of churches get to that place. And so that Somebody says something that offends them, and so right away, we've got to either make a rule against that, or we've got to do something because they offended me. That's the opposite of what we've been talking about. About being strong enough, being tough enough, being man or woman enough to be able to let somebody else make a decision. And that that comes from the way the way you do that often is through adversity and struggles god knows that we need those things we don't like them we don't want them but that's what makes us strong that cross that we despise we've told the story about the man carrying a cross and some wise fellow come along and said why don't you just cut off Cut off a little bit of the cross and it'll be a little easier to carry. So he stopped and bought a saw and cut off a few feet of the cross and 
he was struggling along again. Someone said, man, you're struggling. Why don't you cut off that, cut off a little more of that? So he cut off a little more and did that several times until it was just a little old bitty thing. He was just lugging it right along, whistling. And he got to the river that led to heaven. And there was a sign there that said, lay your cross down. That's your bridge to get you in. And he laid his cross down and it floated right down the river because it wasn't near long enough to get to the other side. So he couldn't make it. Kind of a funny little story. But there's so much truth in just making it easy and making it easy and making it easy on us that we don't have strength to get to the other side. It's adversity that builds character and strength. You know, it's work. We, we think of a diamond, a beautiful diamond, was actually a piece of coal that had just been under so much pressure of the earth, just pressed so firmly, so hard for years and years. It's a piece of coal that's just turned into a diamond. But it took an immense amount of struggle and pressure for it to be formed that way. And that's the way we are. You know, when everything is just so easy for us, and we just have the talent or the ability just to float across through life and do all the, do everything we want to do, we're not making many diamonds like that. We're not producing much gold in eternity. We don't like it. It's against the flesh. But being faithful and being what God wants us to be you know, the, the weak, you know, sometimes the person that's having the biggest struggle, they're drawn near to God. They're learning to lean on Him. They're learning to rest. And the person that looks like they're just floating through life, doing everything just right, What is it going to look like in eternity when God reveals that it's the weak? Not that we try to make things difficult, but the way the person that isn't having any struggles, isn't having many struggles, we all have struggles, but the person that's able to do a lot of those things you have the opportunity to be merciful, to be patient, to be empathetic. Put yourself in someone else's shoes. You know, that person that's suffering, they may be grumbling and complaining, and we just can look back and say, well, why don't they just trust in the Lord? You know, why don't they just have enough faith? And they're doing all they can just to take another breath. Sometimes whenever you get in that place, it's the last thing you even want to think about. The perfect church we talked about is not because everything there goes just the way we think it ought to. The perfect church is a church that loves one another. The perfect church can look out at somebody else it's trying to follow the Lord that isn't near where we are and think that what opportunities have they had that we haven't or that we've had that they haven't. You know, whenever we first started just kind of untangling all this mess with all the different religion around us, we probably didn't look very appealing 
to an established church member. You know, we probably didn't look very nice to the established holy community. But someone walking in the light that they have, Jesus talked about this, about walking in the light. And look at the people He called. Look at the people who chose to follow Him. They were the ones that rejected by the holy. Things haven't changed a bit. That very thing is going on today. We, that spirit of, I'm holy, and you don't measure up to me. You know, we think it's them wicked old Pharisees. But in eternity, it's going to be revealed that that same spirit was just as strong today as it was when Jesus walked the earth. And God is still looking for the one that will just humble himself. You know, there's, he may have given us talents and abilities. Use them. Use them for good. He may, he was given us a blessed church, a blessed brotherhood that loves each other. Don't get complacent in it. You do your part. You do your part to have something to pass on to the next generation. Take the gifts that God has given you. Not just the outward good looking part, but that inward humility, that inward empathy that we can have for others while still maintaining that part that looks nice to the world, the part that looks nice to us. Seek after the real fruit. Seek after that which lasts forever. Then we have something to pass along to the next generation. You know, we don't, we have uh, no man's an island. You and I affect each other. And what we do and the things that we do, others are watching and others are following. And it's pretty easy to pass on those things that everybody loves and seeks towards that kind of perfection. But don't forget that kind that, of perfection that God's looking for. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are those that forgive, they'll be forgiven. You know, when Jesus was on the earth, it wasn't he wasn't the popular, good looking religious man that we all have in our mind. It was a he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And the disciples saw that in him. They saw something in him. They saw something much deeper than just the polished religion. They saw a man that was going to take a cross and they followed him. And it's the same today. Have our eyes, we need our eyes set on the gold that God is looking for. We have an opportunity to be perfect just as our Father in Heaven is perfect. And that's when we have His Spirit, His attitude. May God add His blessings. Anyone have anything you'd like to share? I was thinking about what said one time when we went out street preaching someone was talking about being perfect.
you had used an example of a, of a kindergartner who was supposed to color on a piece of paper. And I always uh, think about that a lot. And you can use an example of that the teacher was God given them uh, and showing them. We can use many examples of the uh, disciples or even Jesus coming in. Using that example of showing the child how to become perfect. And using an example of what you talked about tonight. Now, today, uh, taking a talent and giving what he has given us the ability, he has given us the ability to be able to be perfect. Mm. Thanks, Lord. I just had a thought when. Uh, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but just the, it said uh, about burying the talent and if you at least should, if you at least were going to put it into use, then uh, I could have given it to the creditors or put it in the bank so that it would have been received with interest. For some reason, my mind went to the passage that Jesus said uh, to the scribes and the Pharisees, you, will, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven yourselves and then you hinder others from going in. Mm -hmm. And I just just thought that maybe that has something to do with, you know, if you're not going to go into the kingdom of heaven, if you're going to bear your opportunity going into the kingdom of heaven, at least go or whatever, you know, if you're not going to take advantage of your opportunity to go to the kingdom of heaven, at least don't hinder other people. Mm -hmm. At least don't, at least don't make it a, at least don't, don't make a hardship for others that are trying to do it. Amen. Whether that's the, has anything to do with that or not, I just wondered. Amen. Yeah, the thing Jason brought up was, I'd forgotten about that, but. You know, if you, when the Bible says, be therefore perfect, you know, a lot of people say, well, that's not obtainable. But, you know, if you went to a kindergartner and said, I want you to spell encyclopedia, they would think that was completely out of their reach. They wouldn't even know, they wouldn't have a clue. But each day, whenever the kindergarten teacher gives them a little paper, it's got a big A on it, and there's an apple in the middle of it. And they give them a crayon and said, here, A is for apple. And they paint the apple red, and they learn that A is for apple. They get a gold star for that day. It's perfect. You know, but the college student or the real intellectual that can spell every word, they might scoff at somebody only being able to color an apple and say A is for apple. But in God's eyes and in the teacher's eyes, that person was perfect that day. So whatever level we're on, just be faithful for today. Color your apple today. And after a few years, you might be able to spell apple. But be perfect today. And You'll learn that lesson. And that's what God, that's perfection to God. It's not the ability per, to perform excellence the way we think of it, but to perform excellence. And he colored an apple red and knew that that was started with an A. And that was perfection. And that's what God's looking for us. Be, be perfect where you're at. All right, well, God bless y'all. We'll meet back together at 6 o'clock this evening. We'll depart in peace.